minutes. So let's see how many we get through. We'll try and be super concise. I'll also get back to you with um, some info from Raoul on anyone we don't get to. Maria, however, gets to go first. She was the first brave person to put a question in the Q&A. Maria asks, what do you do when the product is not meeting client expectations? For example, a past client isn't interested in renewing due to poor results. So really great question. Um, and it to a degree does slightly depend on what the product is. Um, there is always going to be a challenge if the product is not doing what it needs to. And I can't push enough. If you're selling a product that isn't effective in any way, then you are going to be more challenged than if you're selling a product A, you really believe in, but B, that works. But what I would say is going back to expectation setting is absolutely crucial. So based on the... Uh, buyer research from around 25,000 buyers recently, the thing that has the biggest impact on win rates is actually setting realistic expectations. And one of the reasons why customers are often disappointed or upset with the outcomes is because the expectations normally haven't been set early on. They've been left to the customer to come up with their own, or if they have been set, They've been wowed by amazing testimonials and they suddenly think they're going to get this whopper of an impact. And actually what's happening now is when we go in with those whoppers of impacts, people don't believe them. But if they do and they don't achieve it, they're going to be upset. So a big piece of it is reframing what the realistic outcomes you can achieve are compared to what the customer is going to get. As an example, if you were to work in a media and events space and you ran an event and not many people turned up, as an example, then re-engineering their expectations around the quality and importance of one lead compared to 50 would be the way that you're going to do it and think about the impact you could have there. Maria, I hope that helps. But if there is more you need, then please get in touch and we'll uh, look at your individual challenge uh, and do what we can to help. Thanks, Raoul. One now from Tyler. Do you see a difference in the challenges or best practice approach depending on whether the lead is inbound versus outbound? So brilliant question brilliant brilliant question um overall the challenges are pretty similar but i think interestingly the mistakes sales people make are different right so one of the mistakes uh that happen when we get an inbound lead is often we take our foot off the gas a little bit in terms of due diligence so we assume based on the research 57 percent of the deal is already done or decisions already made by the time they get in touch with you but what that means is sales people will often ask a couple of questions and pretty quickly go to that pitch part the problem is your customer, even though they're contacting you, it doesn't mean they're committed to change. And so making sure that we go back to why are you doing this in the first place? What's the KPIs you need to move? Where are you against them? What's your approach at the moment? What's led you to decide you need this now? Why is it urgent? Is super important, but it's often missed when it comes to inbound because we kind of think the customer's done that bit already. The other thing to think about is, especially on inbound, you will on average be one of three people they're going to. And often we get an inbound lead and think, woohoo, great, this is a, in the bag. But actually, there's these other two people they're having conversations with over here who are thinking the same. And it often comes down to a price battle and so finding out their criteria and trying to help them sculpt a criteria for choosing you or someone else but helping them sculpt it in a way that only you can fit into super important when you're asking those questions helping that person see the decision making criteria that leads them to you is a really undervalued and underappreciated skill from salespeople, especially when it comes to inbound hope that helps tyler Thank you, Raoul. We've got the brilliantly named Anna now asking, uh, she said, you mentioned smashing the phones. Do you think this is as effective anymore? Or is there a way you would say that is more beneficial? Super question. I think I've said that for all of them, but it is. So <laughs> um, uh, my, my recommendation is sequence multi-touch, multi-platform. So what I mean by that is if you just hammer the phones, you're going to struggle in certain industries, you'll be lucky in some and you'll be successful in others but without a shadow of a doubt if you send an email and then phone you'll get more success if you send an email then phone but don't leave a voicemail and then uh send them a message on uh, linkedin and do this over like a week long period you'll have more impact so on average salespeople will reach out to customers whether it's through the phone or email two times and then they'll give up but on average it takes the normal buyer, eight approaches to engage. So 
My take is what you want to do is build out a sequence over three or four weeks that uses different approaches. Use LinkedIn first to follow someone. Start commenting where they're having their conversations. Become a brand they know as a person. Then connect. Then phone them. If you don't get through, email them. And then what you want to do is start varying it using things like LinkedIn voice messages. Many people don't know they can do this. There's a little voice icon on LinkedIn that increases the chance of responses by three or four times. Use things like Vidyard to get people recording videos and seeing you in person. These are really great ways that actually don't take too long to do and really make you stand out. Ultimately, it's about being there when they want to engage with you. But that's about being persistent, but not a pest. Thanks, Raoul. Right, I'm going to give you one minute for one more question. Ben, I want to hear an answer to this too. With decision-making units being so large now, how realistic is it to have all of them on one call? Should salespeople focus on a champion or two and develop from there? You've got one minute, Raoul, no more. One minute. The likelihood, if it's a big decision-making process, I'm talking fast, so apologies, I'm going to slow down, is... <laughs> Quite slow, quite low, sorry. So it might be unlikely in a massive enterprise business that you're going to get the CEO on the call or the CFO. But totally right. Picking the champions, but also, sorry, what was the chap's name? Uh, I've just moved on. Ben. Ben. But Ben, also identifying the blockers, right? Identifying who has allegiances to other approaches and finding out what those speed bumps are going to be has never been more important but as opposed to just ignoring those people finding out who they are and think oh, i don't want to talk to them trying to engage them trying to get on them on board or if they're never going to get them on board building a critical mass of other people so there's consensus in their business is super important unlikely you'll speak to everyone but making sure you can speak to as many as you can and making sure you're bringing them together around a common challenge that all of them care about, that you can help solve, is super important.